All right, here we are at our class uh, this morning uh, for First uh, Corinthians. We continue in our series. Um, I think we've, uh, we've titled this First Corinthians Letters to a Troubled Church because there were certainly a lot of issues going on at that particular congregation. We've uh, named some of those issues. Matter of fact, that's how we're studying the book, not necessarily going through uh, each chapter line by line, but picking out particular topics throughout the book and discussing those uh, each, uh, each time we meet. So now we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Appreciate if you open your uh, Bibles to that, uh, particular, uh, to that particular chapter. And uh, I want to read verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 27 for you, uh, if you'd uh, like to read along with me. Uh, Paul is talking about the communion, so on and so forth. And then he says, after his uh, comments about the communion itself, he says, therefore, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And it makes you think when you read that particular verse, um, uh, has, it ever, has it ever dawned on you that there may be times when we take the communion in a way that is displeasing to God? Or in a way that causes us to be guilty of sin rather than washed clean of sin. You know, we take the communion every single uh, Sunday, certainly we offer it to everyone to take every single Sunday, but sometimes there can be a problem with uh, the way that we take it and uh, Paul is discussing that here. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul rebukes just such a situation in the Corinthian church that was causing them uh, to partake in the Lord's Supper or the communion in an unworthy manner, unworthy or in an improper manner. And since communion is, some, communion is something that we do so often, we do it on a regular basis, I think it's worthwhile studying what Paul has to say about our state of mind and the state of our hearts when we do take uh, the uh, communion. Uh, as we'll read in a moment, uh, Paul has received news about the conduct going on at this particular church. Remember, the letter to the Corinthian was, uh, Corinthians was a letter that Paul sent to them because he had received news about the conduct, some of the problems that were going on in that particular congregation. And so he writes this letter to give them advice, sometimes to rebuke them or to teach them about the particular issues going on, among other things. There was a competition for leadership among some of the teachers in that particular congregation. Uh, there was sexual uh, immorality going on uh, among some of the members. Uh, there was disorder between men and women in regards to teaching and in regards to the role that they played uh, in the church. So a lot of, lot of problems, that's one of the reasons why you know, we're studying this particular book uh, and we're calling it Letter to a Troubled Church. There was trouble in that church, this was the letter that went out to correct some of those problems. So in this particular passage, we get a glimpse of what problems they were having in the area of public worship, especially uh, in the area of the Lord's Supper. So uh, I want you to stay in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This time, let's look at verse 17. Paul says, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now this verse here, verse 17, is a bridge verse. It's a linking verse, if you wish, from the last set of instructions about veils. We talked about that before. And maintaining proper order between men and between women within the congregation. He says here that they have created disorder not only with the veil issue, but also with the next issue concerning the Lord's Supper. So in the letter he moves from one issue to the other and verse 17, as I said, is a bridge between one discussion moving on to another. So we go on to verse 18 this time and he says, um, he says the following, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, he says uh, or makes a distinction if you wish, uh, about coming together as the church. Specifically, Paul says, when you come together as the church. And I, I want to explain this idea of coming together uh, as the church because it helps differentiate various situations that all of us experience. 
when individual members um, come together, all of us are Christians, right? So individual members are Christians and we are members of the church wherever we are. But there is a special entity that is created when individual Christians consciously come together or meet together as the church. Um, let me give you an example. Three brothers in the Lord uh, getting together for a cup of coffee and having some fellowship. Each one of them is a member of the church, but they do not constitute a church when they get together. You see the difference? They're all members of the church, but they don't constitute a particular church or a particular congregation just because three are together having coffee and having fellowship. I'll give you another example. Let's say 10,000 people, let's, let's up the number a little bit. Let's say 10,000 people converge at a Christian university to hear speakers and to share fellowship. We would say that all of them belong to the body of Christ. But those 10, 000, even though they're 10,000 people, they're, they don't form a congregation. They're not uh, 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 a church of some kind. They belong to the church, but they are not the church. They're not coming together as the church. So the point I'm trying to make here is that Christians can be together without coming together as the church. And that's what Paul is saying here. When you come together as the church in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, what transforms a fellowship of Christians who are simply gathering together for fellowship or work or whatever, what, what transforms a fellowship of Christians into a gathering of the church are the rules that guide their purpose and their conduct during their meeting. And that's what he's talking about here. They're violating the rules and conduct that needs to be present when they meet together as the church. Now, Christians are always supposed to act in a holy and a proper way, no matter where they are. But when they gather as a church, there are some procedures, some goals, some activities that they are required to have and required to do that are not required when they meet in a casual way, simply for fellowship. Let me give you an example. Um, there are no elders that oversee and direct a college lectureship. But if the same group decides to be a church, they must select elders who will guide and um, oversee that particular group. You see, there are rules of conduct and organization that covers when Christians meet together as a church that need to be followed, that don't need to be followed when two or three brothers or even 10,000 brothers get, to get together for fellowship or for some sort of activity. Um, there's no communion that is served at a, uh, a college lectureship, but if the group came together as a church, then they would need to prepare and serve the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. See the difference? See the, the conduct here, the rules? Um, lectureships have no duty to preach the gospel or to care for the sick, but if this group were to meet as a church, then they would be duty bound to carry out these, these tasks. So if three brothers who are members of the church get together for coffee, all they have to do is to have coffee. If they want to pray and encourage each other, that's fine. And, and, and the Lord is among them. But they don't constitute a church at that point. If three brothers decide they want to be a church, then they're required to function under the guidelines and do the work of the church that is given by Jesus and explained throughout the, the New Testament. So if we understand that idea, then we understand that, um, that Paul is addressing this issue with the Corinthians when they come together as a church. They are bringing many practices into that meeting that are improper, even outside the context of church life let alone dragging them into the activity of the church. See the problem here? They have, the Corinthians have specifically come together as a church. And so therefore, because of that, they're supposed to be guided by certain rules of conduct because they're coming together 
as a church. Well, what was going on in Corinth is they were breaking these rules or they were ignoring these rules or they were bringing in other issues, other types of conduct that were not proper uh, for a meeting of the church. So if we, if we understand that idea, then the following verses will make a little more sense to us. Let's pick up uh, once again in verse 18, chapter 11, I want you to read with me here. It says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. So Paul here mentions four things that are improper, not just in the church, but in outside activity as Christians as well. But especially if they're going to meet as a, as a church, there are certain rules of conduct that they are breaking here. First one is division. He says there are cliques. You know, there are little groups, little parties there. And, and groups that are not in fellowship or exclusive one to another. You know, we belong to this group, you belong to that group, this group can't cross over to that group, and so on and so forth. Secondly, he says there's, there's competition. And what was going on there were different groups were supporting different leaders who were jockeying for position, like politicians. I mean, there can be competition in politics. I mean, you know, even in those days, people competed, if you wish, for positions in the government. But in the church, if you come together as the church, we don't compete with each other for positions in the church. We don't compete with each other for leadership roles in the church. We don't compete with each other and form groups that follow one teacher or another teacher. We don't, we don't do that uh, in the church. And that's what was taking place uh, at Corinth at the time. The third thing he says that was happening was a, a form of unkindness, a lack of love towards a certain group of people. You see, what was supposed to be a love feast, which, which was another word for a fellowship meal, what was supposed to be a love feast becomes an occasion for offense in that particular church. You know, usually they had their gathering in the evening because um, uh, many of the members of that particular church were slaves. I explained a few weeks ago that in that society um, there were many people who were freedmen, but there were many who served as slaves. And because they were slaves, they worked seven days a week. They worked from sun up to sundown and were only free in their movements, if you wish, from their masters uh, after, uh, after dark. And so many times the early church, especially this particular church, would have uh, services, uh, a gathering in the evening so that all of the members, freedmen and slaves, could, uh, could attend. And so uh, part of their, uh, part of their uh, tradition, if you wish, part of their activity was to have a, a fellowship meal. They would gather together and have a fellowship meal and they called this a love feast. Well, what was happening, what Paul is referring to here is that the, the wealthy who have food would come early because, well, they didn't have any work to do and they would eat. And then the slaves who had no food who have to work until sundown, they would arrive hungry, uh, but they would be too late to eat because the food was gone. And so there was a certain kind of, uh, of un, unchristian unkindness that were taking place among these people. The ones who had freedom and food and so it would come early, they'd eat, they'd, you know, and we'll find out they were even going beyond that. And those who were poor and who were restricted because of their position in life, uh, and had to come late, not only did they have to come late, but they had no food to eat, and no, so they would, they would go hungry. And then the fourth thing that uh, Paul says is taking place in this, uh, in this particular congregation is the question of revelry. Again, what is supposed to be a love feast turns into a pagan feast of excess where people get drunk. Remember in Corinth, a lot of the people there were uh, uh, you know, had been pagans before, uh, they had been used to 
uh, different types of uh, religious experiences. Part of their religious experience, many of them, was to drink alcohol and get drunk, or even some of them would have sexual activity uh, in their religious uh, practices. So you can imagine you know, coming over from that kind of, uh, from that kind of experience into uh, a Christian experience where those things obviously are not part of our, of our habits. And so in New Testament times, Christians often shared a meal and they had communion as part of the meal because they read that you know, Jesus, at the Last Supper, if you wish, instituted the, the Lord's Supper. And this was, as we know, probably due to the fact that uh, uh, the communion uh, was uh, instituted by Jesus during the Passover meal. We read about that in Jude chapter 12 and 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 13. Those authors also talk about abuses. You know? So we go on and we read in verse 22. He says what? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. So this verse here, where uh, Paul is saying, what, do you not have houses in which to eat and drink, or do you despise the church, and so on and so forth, this verse is used quite often by many to say that you know, we're not allowed to eat in the building. I mean, perhaps uh, some of uh, the people watching this uh, lesson, um, on, on video, others uh, even here in our congregation, maybe you, that's what you believe or you have family that believe that. You know that it's not proper to have a meal inside the church building and use this particular verse to support that idea. Now of course I respect those who feel this way and, and of course I would never pressure anyone to go against their conscience. However, in those times the apostles commented and participated in these love feasts. I mean, Paul did this at Troas in Acts chapter 20, verse seven. They had the meal and they had the communion as part of the, of the love feast. Their teaching was that there should be true love and proper conduct during these times. Not that the agape meals, and that's what they were called, agape meals, that they should be abolished. You know, we, I think, and I, you know, with all due respect, we think that the apostle here is saying there should be no eating in the building, and that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that there should be love at the love feasts. We should consider each other during these times. In verse 22, Paul rebukes those who have been unkind, and that's really the basis of it. It's just unkindness. Somebody comes in and eats their lunch or eats the supper and leaves nothing for no one else. That's just unkind. He doesn't say you can't have the love feast or the agape meal or what we call a fellowship meal. He doesn't say you can't have that in the building. Rather, he instructs those who can't share or can't wait for the participation of everyone to eat at home. He's saying, look, if you can't wait for everybody, just stay home and eat. You know, if all you want to do is satisfy your hunger, then eat at home. You know, that way you won't offend any, anyone. But he's not saying you're not allowed to eat at the church building. He's not saying you can't eat when you come together. He's simply giving instructions on how we should conduct ourselves when we are together in order to eat a love meal or a love feast, if you wish. And now we'll read verse 23 to 26. He goes on to say, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which He was betrayed took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, He took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So now, uh, in these verses, He reviews with them the purpose for the meeting and the meal in the first place. And the reason for the meeting and the reason for the meal is Jesus Christ. It's not about food. It's not about drink. It's not about who's first. 
It's not about who receives honor. The purpose for the church to gather is to honor Jesus Christ by sharing the Lord's Supper. It's not even about the love feast. I mean, the love feast is fine. And if that group of Christians wanted to, you know, while they were having a fellowship meal, wanted to insert the Lord's Supper within that, that's fine. But let's remember why we're there. We're not there to eat food. We're there to share the Lord's Supper. And so the love feast is supposed to reflect the unity and the love and the nourishment of the whole body. That's the reason for the meal. A fellowship meal is not just about food. It's, about a, it's a reflection of who we are and how we feel about each other and what we believe. What they were doing was ruining that thing. They were doing exactly the opposite. They were showing their division. They were showing their unkindness. They were showing their lack of love. None of those things in any way reflected the reality of their Christianity. None of it in any way reflected the true meaning of the Lord's Supper. So when they gathered together as a church, it was for the express purpose of making a public statement that they were disciples of Jesus Christ. I mean, when we gather as a church, right, what are we doing? We're saying we're Christians, we believe. So communion is a silent witness of who we are and what we expect to happen. We're Christians, we believe that Jesus died for us. We're anticipating His return. And how do we do that? We give a, a silent witness by taking, by taking the communion. You know, people, uh, they, have, uh, you know, they march around with signs, you know, what they believe, down with this, up with that, whatever. You know, they're making a witness in what they believe. They march in the streets, higher pay or unionize this. You know, they're, they're making a witness. Well, every Lord's Day we make a witness, but we don't march around with signs and we don't have blowhorns, you know, bullhorns saying, you know, free this or do that. We, we, we offer a silent witness of who we are, what we believe, and what we expect to happen. So Paul is saying to them, they were spoiling their witness by their conduct during the meal. And Paul tells them that if they can't do it right, then they should just stay home and eat. He doesn't say you can't eat. He just says if you can't do it right, then don't do it at all. So in verse 27, 32, Paul now warns them about the possibility of taking communion in an unworthy manner and the consequences. So now you see this kind of falls into, falls into context. So read with me as we keep on going in our study, verse 27 this time. He says, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So a person who takes communion normally does so to signify that the body and the blood of Jesus removes his sins. But to take communion improperly, as they were, has the opposite effect. It adds one more sin to their charge. I mean, isn't that crazy? Imagine coming to take the communion and instead of remembering Jesus and having the effect of remembering that His blood takes away your sins, by having the communion you add a sin? Talk about you know, uh, uh, counter, uh, counterproductive. So such a serious sin that Paul compares it to actually being guilty of crucifying the Lord all over again by their actions. And he says that in verse 28 and 29. Uh, it begins 28, he says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he, if he does not judge the body correctly. So he warns them to examine their conduct and to avoid the judgment and condemnation that comes with the behavior that they're involved in. So judging the body, you know, I've heard so many lessons on what does it mean, judging the body? Well, it can mean one of two things. One, it can mean discerning or understanding that the communion represents the Lord's body and to take the elements that represent the Lord's body in a way that is not proper is an offense against the body that the elements represent. You know, um, uh, 
if you burn a flag, right? Are you burning down the country? Are you, if, if you take the, our flag, our nation's flag, and you burn it, are, are you burning down the country? Is anybody killed? No. But you are, you are creating an offense against the country. Why? Because the flag represents our nation. Well, Paul is saying somewhat the same thing. If, if, you, if you take the elements of the communion, if you take them in a way that is improper as they were, well then you're not sinning against the bread and the, and the, and the fruit of the vine, you're sinning against what they represent, the body of Christ Himself. So that, that could be one meaning. The other meaning could be discerning the nature of the church, in other words, the body of Christ, as a loving and holy fellowship. In other words, to act improperly in or against these people is an offense against the head of the body, which is Jesus Christ. Either way, it's an offense against Christ. You either offend Him directly or you offend His body, of which He is the head. And so that's why he's talking about judge the body correctly. Realize what you're doing here. Either way, taking communion in an unworthy manner is an offense to God in Christ as well as His church. And then we finish up with uh, verse 30 here, or we move on with verse 30. He says, for this reason many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. Now in that time the displeasure of God for this offense seemed to be manifested by illness and death in the church. The people who had gifts, imagine the irony. These people in Corinth, they had gifts of healings. They could heal people, they could speak in unknown languages, they, they could prophesy, they had all kinds of spirit, powerful, miraculous spiritual gifts. Imagine the irony, these people who had gifts of healings, but because of their conduct, their gifts were not working, and many of them were struck with illness and with death. And so now we finish up verse 31 and 32, and three and four, let's read the 31 and 32 first. He says, but if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. If they conduct themselves properly, then God would not punish them. However, if they are being punished, they should submit to it because God ultimately wants to save their souls which reminds you how serious it is to sin against the body. They weren't going out and killing people. They weren't going out and robbing or committing adultery in this case. They were, they were not having the right heart when they were taking the communion. And Paul is telling them how serious a sin this is. And now we finish up with the last two verses, verse 33 and 34. So he says, So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you may not come together for judgment and the remaining matters I shall arrange when I come. I want you to notice something. He does not abolish the love feast. He doesn't say you're not allowed to come and, and you know, meet together at the building or the meeting place, wherever you are, in order to eat. He merely gives instructions concerning it. And the instruction is, if you can't wait for each other, then eat at home and avoid condemnation and punishment. He says it right here. He says, so then my brethren, when you come together to eat, Paul is assuming that they come together. Paul is assuming that they're going to come together and continue having that love feast. He's saying, when you do this, if you can't wait, if you can't wait for everyone to be there in order to eat together, then eat at home first so that you will not cause an offense with your unkindness and you'll avoid punishment. All right, so let's keep the love feast. Let's just make sure you do it properly by keeping the love in the love feast. All right, a couple of lessons here before we kind of wrap it up for today. A couple of things that we've learned from this passage I think that, that kind of stand out. First is this, in order to be a church we must follow the instructions for worship and organization and work and so on and so forth uh, that are outlined in the New Testament. Christians gathering together in one spot do not automatically constitute a church or a congregation. 
you have to purposefully be coming together as a church and purposefully following the rules and regulations and the instructions in the New Testament for what a church is supposed to be in order to come together as a church. Number two, it's possible to take communion in an unworthy manner today. I mean, is it possible to do that today? And if so, how? Well, first of all, acting unworthily towards Jesus. How do we do that today? Well, to proclaim the Lord's death as a silent witness by taking communion, but then giving a witness of disbelief by your actions and words each day is bringing judgment on yourself. That's a long way of saying being hypocritical. You, know, you take the communion in an unworthy manner. If you take the communion on Sunday and Sunday afternoon, you know, you're doing things that are absolutely unchristian. Communion is a silent way to say, I believe. So your lifestyle, um, the rest of the week needs to match up with your witness on Sunday. I mean, would someone believe that you've taken communion on Sunday by the way you act on Monday? You know, there's the litmus test right there. And another way of acting unworthily is acting unworthily towards the body of Jesus. The Corinthians were judged because they treated their brethren badly and acted badly in the assembly. How can we refuse to support the church? Uh, how can we not serve the church? How can we speak badly about the church, neglect our responsibilities in the church, act in a disrespectful way at church, you know, bad speech, practice our bad habits, act foolishly during worship, and then take the communion? You know, I, I'm, I'm going to go from teaching here to preaching and meddling a little bit. How can we, seriously now, how can we sit there in the pew and be checking our email or playing games on our phones three minutes before communion and then just pause everything to take communion and think that we are actually taking communion in a respectful fashion. I mean, really? So it's not just in the first century. It's in our century too. I mean, I see it all the time because believe it or not, the preachers are sitting with you in the pews and watching what happens. You know, perhaps our lives would go better too if we judge the body correctly at communion. And then maybe one other, one other lesson here and, and that is communion is the true love feast. Remember that they ate together to signify that they were one body, that they loved each other and that they were all growing in Christ. So as far as my personal belief, I believe it's okay to eat together in the building because they did it then. However, let's remember that their love feast was there to prepare them for the true love feast, which was the communion. Let's have our fellowship dinners, absolutely, but let's remember that they should be about love and sharing and growth and not just about convenience and food. Now the one thing that communion does is identify those who are confessing Christ and those who are not confessing Christ. So this Sunday, you know, like every other, we'll be serving the Lord's Supper. Between now and then, I would encourage you to reevaluate our lives and our attitude towards this body as Christ Himself. And if there's something that needs to be changed, if there's a step that needs to be taken, then I, I encourage everyone who's listening to this lesson to do that. Let's make sure that we come to the table in a worthy manner this Sunday and every Lord's Day as we renew our faith by remembering Jesus with the bread and the fruit of the vine. Okay, well that's our lesson for today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you at home for those of you who are following us as we stream online. And thank you to those who are watching this uh, on video, perhaps a little later on after the class is over. We'll see you next time for our next lesson in 1 Corinthians.